Holy One, thank you. Thank you for all those who are here, either in person or through the miracle of technology. Be with us in this time that it would draw us ever closer to you. Amen. So I was doing a very small amount of math and thinking that it must have been about 2002 when one day I was driving my little escort over the Glen Jackson Bridge and suddenly there was a loud, like a pop, and then some more noises and the sounds of things under the car and then in the rear view, what was left of the tire that just blew, running out behind me. We were coming back from, from Suzuki violin lessons, and I know what year it was because I know what year Rachel was three. And she was sitting in the back of the car, still in a car seat, and somewhere there was the teeniest, tiniest little violin you can even imagine in the car with us. And as I was thinking about this, I am, I am thinking that when you do driver's ed, maybe they tell you what you should do when a tire goes on a bridge on a highway and you're doing 55 miles an hour. But I can tell you that it didn't come to mind in that moment. And I, I kind of instinctively knew that I wanted to slow down and I knew that I did not want to be stopped on the highway, and I knew that I didn't want to be stopped on the wrong side of the highway. And so I got over, I slowed down and got over and got off and pulled to a stop. And if you know that part of the world, which I didn't really know that neighborhood at that point, but, but so I'm basically on, I think, that ramp between 205 and 14. And I'm pulled off to the side three-year-old in the car, and all I can do is breathe, like, everybody's okay. That was the moment when I decided to get a cell phone. We have these moments, don't we? We have these moments where we have sudden clarity about what is important and what is necessary. And they become stories that we tell. And in the telling, they frame kind of a collective identity of what is important, what matters. Sometimes also they just tell, you know, funny stories about members of the family when said family member brings the new girlfriend home for the first time. But lucky families have good storytellers. But whether we have good storytellers or not, we all have these stories. And as people of faith, our community together is shaped and framed by the stories that we share, right? And we have them in scripture, and we have them in the book of Common Prayer, and rarely are they intersecting as obviously as they do right around now in our church year uh, because um, we get the text from Paul that talks about remembering. And so usually, okay, so I will say, usually when I talk to you all, I assume you have the texts in front of you. So literally, I could make up anything now, and, and only some of you would catch me. Um, <laughs> because it's not, they're not in your bulletins, but I promise I'm not doing that. But there's the text from Paul, and, and we have Jesus' words, and Jesus says, remember, right? To do this in remembrance of me, and that's right in our liturgy that's in our Book of Common Prayer. And we have the text from Exodus, and in that text there is also the law, the instruction that Passover is to be a day of remembrance. 
We are to remember through these stories that we share who God is and who we are. And John's gospel today goes into basically stop time, right? So that'll maybe my only sports reference ever. But you know how three minutes of a game can take way, way longer than three minutes? So John's gospel goes from creation until this dinner tonight in 12 chapters. And now we get five straight chapters in this room. This is the beginning of them. Uh, and it's like John is saying, listen. Listen to what Jesus did and said with his nearest and dearest people when he knew he was almost out of time. And he gives us uh, the foot washing tonight, right? And we get a new commandment. So I've been humming, right? I think there's a song, they will know we are Christians by our love, right? We get this new commandment to love other people as Jesus loves. And we hear these, uh, we hear these uh, stories, this, uh, this instruction from Jesus, and we do kind of two things with them. In the church, we tell these stories and we enact them, right? Like tonight we're going to wash feet literally exactly as Jesus says. But also, as the church, when we go from this place, we get to ask ourselves the question, when Jesus says love people as he has loved us, and in church it looks like washing people's feet, what does that look like out there? This Chapter begins what is sometimes called the farewell discourses for Jesus. You, 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 you may have noticed that the word love comes up a lot. Also, throughout these next chapters is the word cosmos. It means world. What does it mean to love in the world? What does it mean if our example is the washing of feet? Well, I can tell you two things. It's probably really personal, and it's probably not tidy, is it? Right? We... We're very neat and clean, and especially in COVID, we got everything wiped down to within an inch of its life. But Jesus, one of the things I love is he gets messy, doesn't he? Have you ever thought about what it means to divide up fish on the fly for a whole bunch of people to eat those fish when you did not know you were food prepping? I mean, that's messy. Mud, making mud with spit to heal somebody's eyes. Letting someone dump excessive, unbelievable, strong-smelling oils on you and anoint you. This is messy, messy stuff. And Jesus not only was messy in his physicality, which I love, but he was, he was kind of messy in his willingness to be a little fast and loose sometimes with the rules. Right? He says the Sabbath serves God's people, not the other way around. Because that core value of loving people has to be at the center of everything. 
And if that means we're going to be close to people that rules said were unclean, then that means we're going to be close to them. And if it means we're going to eat with them, then it means we're going to eat with them. Right? It, uh, so the challenge then becomes, what does that look like for us? And it has to come from that place of love. I don't want you to hear me saying, go do something unpleasant because Jesus. I want for us to leave this place feeling deeply that we are so loved. We are so loved even when it's messy even when it's hard, abundantly loved. And how do we live that out so that it seeps into the world that we live in? So that day in 2002, I'm sitting with a blank like, I have, I have no idea. And this white van pulls up behind me. And I can't decide if this is bad news or good news. Like, I don't know if this is, this is like the beginning of a milk carton story or whatever. But, but I notice it's, it's actually two people, and it's a man and his wife. And I think, okay, well, that's, that's already a promising sign. And they come to the window, and I gingerly roll down my window partway. And the man says, do you have a spare? Oh, light bulb. Yeah, you know what? I probably do. <laughs> that, that would have been a good thing to think about. And he said, you stay in your car. We got this. And they changed my tire. And they got me set to go. And the woman was getting back in her car, and we had been chatting, and she said, by the way, do you know Jesus? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, I am so glad you are my sister in Christ. I want to live in a world where that's how people are. And it has to start here. As Jesus says, if you know these things, if we know these things, we are blessed if we do them. Amen.